Hi, everybody. Thank you for attending. I'm super excited to be here today uh, and share some ideas with you. So first, I wanted to start by naming the problem, and that is um, contingent on college matriculation, Black and Latinx youth are less likely to attain a STEM degree, even though they declare STEM majors at the same rate as white youth. And some researchers attempt to explain this disparity as being due to differences in level and preparation or social economic status and parental education. Yet other research has shown that controlling for these things, there are still differential attrition of Black and Latinx students in STEM majors. And this indicates that there's something particularly problematic in STEM fields, such that the climate there is exclusionary for students of color. And we have seen research that shows that racially minoritized students often must contend with bias, microaggression, stereotype threats, stereotype management, and other exclusionary experiences in STEM classrooms. And scholarship has begun to move past these supposed deficits. And they're recognizing that we must attend to the design of learning environment. And since faculty are responsible for designing several aspects of the learning environment, their beliefs and practices are important to consider. And research has shown that faculty beliefs do inform their practices. For example, faculty who report valuing diversity tend to use more student-centered practices. And today, what I'm going to do is put three different research papers of which I'm an author or co-author in conversations with each other to explore faculty beliefs and how they may be informing exclusionary practice. And the questions asked and answered by those works were, how do college science faculty make sense of the underrepresentation of students of color in STEM? And how do college science instructors conceptualize equity and whether and how their conceptions are associated with teaching and related practices? And finally, how do STEM instructors notice and problematize anti-Black events in classroom cases? And so by answering these questions with you today, I also considered whether and how these beliefs that are uncovered in the, this body of work inform practices in ways that can support or hinder minoritized student success. And at this point, you may ask, well, wait a minute, Tachi, you just critique the deficit perspective of students, but now you appear to be focusing on deficits of faculty? Well, not really. I'm not interested in blaming or vilifying individual faculty members. The majority of STEM faculty are not formally trained in pedagogy or issues of equity. So they're left to make sense of these things on their own. And that's when hegemonic ideologies may come to play. And what I want to do today is to make an argument for how collective beliefs, most of which are informed by hegemonic ideologies, can lead to exclusionary experiences or simply inaction and therefore can perpetuate racial inequality in STEM via faculty beliefs and practices. And so what do I mean by hegemonic ideology? Well, it may be best to start with ideology and define that. And so in a most basic way, ideology could be defined as a, the systemic and integrated set of beliefs whose primary function is explanation. And ideology frames worldviews, values, norms, practices, and help people to explain and justify the causes of specific behaviors or phenomena. And during socialization, that is, when people learn to conform to social norms and become members of a particular group, they're implicitly and explicitly introduced to ideological principles, logics, and discourses that help explain how and why things work the way that they do in that context. And these ideologies then become part of the way people understand the world implicitly and are reproduced as people engage in daily activities and interactions. Now, ideologies can become hegemonic and mediate people's understandings of systems of power in society. Antonio Gramsci coined the term cultural hegemony to describe how control can be exercised by those in power in ways that don't involve coercion or violent means. Instead, people in power create and disseminate discourses or narratives that protect their positions by explaining away inequities and normalizing oppression via half-truths and some lies. And so much like other ideologies, these ideologies um, are assimilated via socialization processes happening in schooling, media, church, and can be assimilated consciously or unconsciously. 
and ideologies then become hegemonic when enough people come to accept these narratives as taken for granted realities and common sense explanations for power differentials and other social injustices. And people and institutions protect these ideas then by claiming them to be inevitable or even natural or by rejecting or ignoring alternative explorations. Therefore, hegemonic ideologies work to reproduce social inequalities and oppression. So liberal ideologies um, have a troubled past. And so I'm not gonna get into too much detail. Uh, Bonilla Silva argues that while liberal ideologies have at times supported progressive political agendas and social movements, these were ideologies made for and by white European people. And even though we now um, see them as a potential uh, ideals to strive forward, many other folks have reshaped these ideologies in the post-civil right era to justify racial inequities and blame racially minoritized people for racial disparities in society. So these uh, reshaping ideas then use these liberal ideals that we care about and that we feel is are important to say that it's already happened. It happened post-civil rights. We are all equal now. There's no such thing as racism or, or any other oppression. And so now these narratives are used in abstract ways that appear fair and normal to perpetuate inequality. For example, Bonilla Silva found that white people opposed affirmative action policies by invoking abstract liberal notions of equal opportunity, which means everyone has equal um, chance, uh, meritocracy, the most qualified applicant should win, and individualism. Any group-based policies are unfair and everyone should be judged as individuals. And so these ideals work to conceal discriminatory practices and structural barriers for people from racially minoritized backgrounds. And therefore they work in the service of maintaining white supremacy. Now, these taken for granted yet highly problematic ideologies in US society are further amplified in academic STEM, a group of fields that upholds whitenesses, neutrality and objectivity. So these are all standards of STEM on top of meritocratic and equal opportunity and colorblind ideals. They all kind of go together, right? Um, to clarify about whiteness, since I haven't talked about that yet, whiteness can manifest itself in STEM in how the values and norms and the practices of white people are centered and normalized. And they're held as a universal standard to which everybody must meet. And if we don't meet it, we don't fit in, right? And so this positions non-white people as inherently inferior if we don't fit in particular ways of being and knowing. And that's often when we hear that not a good fit argument coming up when there's nothing real or concrete to critique folks about um, in admissions or in hiring conversations. Now, liberal ideologies are amplified in STEM because scientists, mathematicians, and engineers, they're all socialized to believe that STEM disciplines are objective, neutral, and fair. And the taken for granted ideals is that it's, that it's a meritocracy. And that makes sense, right? If you're a scientist, you know how hard it is that you need to work in order for you to make it. And so the idea that you're working that hard and you're getting an advantage on top of that makes no sense, right? And so it makes sense that folks want to believe that, you know, because we are objective in our empirical pursuits, that we are also objective as people, but that's not how it works. We're people and we are all um, susceptible to socialization processes and ideological um, understandings that are problematic. And so um, when we take these liberal ideologies and we look at it um, and how it, it manifests in STEM, we can see that it works in the same way as far as the outcome, which is these beliefs dismiss systemic racism operating in those spaces. But scholarship is starting to focus on how these ideologies play out at the level of the college STEM faculty. And this work is arguing that STEM faculty can and do, often inadvertently, 
access Asians that reproduce white supremacy and racial injustice in STEM education. And so I'm situating my the three works that I'm gonna talk about um, in these three theoretical frameworks. First is this idea of race and racism as a social structure, that we live in a society where race and racism operate as a structure that consists of different levels. For example, the interpersonal, the institutional, and the structure shapes the outcomes for people by reproducing advantages and disadvantages based on race via systemic mechanism, as well as interactions in daily life. Second, critical consciousness is this awareness of structural inequality and this recognition um, that people have individual and collective agency and power to disrupt injustices produced by the system. And third is colorblind or color evasive ideology. And this is what Bonilla, Bonilla Silva argues is the hegemonic ideology in the post-civil rights era. In this framework, people who subscribe to colorblind or color evasive racial ideology acknowledge racial inequalities or inequities, but rationalize it in ways that dismiss or minimize racism as the underlying cause. And this perpetuates racial inequality. And so for the methodology, I'll be brief, but um, for the first two studies I'll discuss, I'll cover these methods here, there was snowball sampling. I had 45 faculty members, some uh, 26 in a life science and uh, 19 in a quantitative science. And uh, the data set involved uh, in-depth semi-structured interviews, which um, average about 60 minutes and faculty uh, documents shared by them. I also conducted thematic analysis um, to different types on the different studies. Um, and I can talk more about that later. And so um, I had a total of 45 participants, although for the first, stu first study, I could only use data for 42 of them, but the majority were white men, continuing generation and tenure track faculty and classes they taught include several different types and sizes, but the majority of faculty did teach major majors and upper division um, classes, which makes sense because um, the majority of the sample was tenure and tenure track. And that tends to be the courses that these faculty members teach. And so again, the first study asked, how do college science faculty make sense of the underrepresentation of students of color in STEM? And there were three ways in which they made sense of this underrepresentation. And 71% of them used colorblind racist ideology to discuss these issues. And so the first frame of colorblind racism used to explain underrepresentation was abstract liberalism. So it was a focus on individual student interests, choices, and behaviors, presumably occurring in an equal opportunity meritocratic society. The second was cultural racism, which puts the onus on the student, their families, or communities for deficient values, norms, behaviors, or environments. And the third was minimization of racism. So this acknowledgement that contemporary racial inequality exists but that it's not because of racism, it's due to class, to lack of knowledge, skills, or preparation. And so I'll briefly go over uh, three examples, one example of each with you. And so the first one is abstract liberalism. And this participant says, they, students of color, come to campus and are part of a class where half of the class has some experience in the discipline. And if they see their counterparts excelling and they are struggling, and if they do not reach out for help, I could see how it would be spiral and like, I'm not cut out for this. Well, in this case here, the implication is that the student should know that feeling inadequate is normal and that they should know to ask for help. And if they don't, that's on them. So participants in this category in general brought up student deficit perspectives, that is deficiency in, in preparation and confidence and motivation. But what happens was, by extension, this appeared to erase everyone's responsibility in supporting the students because none of the participants in this category discuss how they help students of color deal with the issues that they dis discuss, right? And yet we know that there are studies that have shown that educators can normalize struggle and failure as part of the learning process so they don't internalize it and become discouraging, discouraged. Um, and Faculty can scaffold curriculum so that students can catch up to their peers or simply making a more 
you know, collaborative environment so that students develop a sense of belonging and they can feel more comfortable asking for help. And so now we have the cultural racism frame, and this is discussing family, and this is what the participants said. I encounter situations where students are supposed to help with family business or help a relative who's sick or some member of the family who needs help. Sometimes I have to kind of take them aside and say, I know this is hard for you, but your family has to understand that you have to be able to give your studies priority in this kind of situation because you have, you know, a full schedule and it's a full time job being a student and so on. The families need to be educated about the need for students to really have free time, take full advantage of their educational opportunities. And so this participant is clearly sympathetic to the issue and discusses how they try to support his students, but they use both abstract liberalism and cultural deficit frames. First, there's this assumption that the family has a choice and not a need for the student to work. We know that non-traditional students um, continue to increase in numbers in academia, and they're probably making the majority in many universities now. And we still operate under the assumption that students come from a homogeneous background and that everyone can make choices in a system of equal access and opportunity, even though some students from minoritized backgrounds think they have to juggle multiple responsibilities, right? And second, and most importantly, in my opinion, this framing judges families of Black, Indigenous, and Latinx students by white Eurocentric standards that value individualistic norms when we know that many students of color tend to belong to cultures that are driven by communal goals and collective success. So much so, research has documented how students of color discuss these communal and collective aspects of their lives as driving forces and sources of encouragement and motivation to persist in these exclusionary spaces of the primarily white institution. And finally, I wanna problematize that idea that a college student is a full-time job because while it may be congruent with the way that higher education was initially designed as available only to white elite men, we clearly can no longer operate from this paradigm. And then we have minimization of racism and cultural racism. And this participant shares, I mean, when you have people who are impoverished and leading the kinds of life that many of them do, it's not only unlikely that they will succeed in STEM fields, it's unlikely they'll even get have a clue what STEM is. And so the problem is, unless you're starting essentially pre-birth, and as soon as a child is born, having them in both a home environment and school environment that's enriching, teaches them to read and get interested in reading, and where they get reinforced for being curious, et cetera, that's where it starts or stops. And so this is you know, a lot to unpack, um, but basically it invokes the deficit thinking of students and it discounts different ways of knowing and doing STEM. First, there's this assumption that many black indigenous and Latinx students are so desperately poor that they cannot learn STEM. Now, even if we accept that racially minoritized people are disproportionately poor due to systemic racism, this doesn't mean that they're incapable of learning, nor that the environment in which they grew up was without wonder, curiosity, or even STEM. And we know of research in funds of knowledge and indigenous ways of knowing STEM um, have shown that multiple, um, the multiple means by which students of color who may be resource poor still engage in STEM activities in their everyday lives. So in summary, this study showed that colorblind ideology informed faculty sense-making and led to deficit thinking and absolution from responsibility. Participants who relied in colorblind frames appear to miss how contemporary racism operates in college and in STEM education, pointing instead to individual or cultural deficits or lack of preparation, and not the exclusion that racially minoritized students face throughout their education pathway. And even those who focus on income disparities engage in the minimization of racism. And so these justifications fail to explain the differential attrition of students of color already enrolled in STEM majors who leave to exclusionary climates. And in some, it, these frames really seem to disempower faculty in doing something about the issues. 
And now because I'm focusing on the manifestation of hegemonic ideologies in the beliefs of faculty, I'm not gonna spend so much time about the smaller group of faculty with the critical consciousness. But I do want to briefly highlight the three ways they discuss in their presentation using systemic racism frames instead of the color evasive ones. So you have idea how to contrast them. So this first theme was making connections. So when faculty connected the same individual level problems mentioned before, right? Um, lack of confidence, lack of motivation, lack of preparation, but the faculty in this category frame the problem in terms of how that effect, that affect or that choice was due to structural bar barriers. And so it was clear to them that um, the so-called individual choices that were being made by students were made under systemic constraints and that they had the power to change that situation and support these students. And awareness of privilege was described by faculty who recognize that privilege or white privilege, especially um, those folks who have it are unable to identify racism or to want to change the system because even in an unconscious level, they recognize that they will be losing something if they have to share uh, power. And finally, um, recognizing bias, which is how they described implicit and explicit biases affecting hiring and admissions decisions and how that worked to maintain inequality. Okay, moving on to the next study, uh, how do college science faculty conceptualize equity and how do these conceptions inform practices? Now, because I'll be talking about um, how hegemonic ideologies may be informing these beliefs, I'll focus in only one here, which is the equality. But I do want to introduce you to the three conceptions of equity that faculty members exhibited. Um, so the majority of faculty define equity as equality, but some also did uh, define it as inclusion or justice. And the majority of faculty said that equity was equal access, treatment, and opportunity regardless of background. And so today I'll focus on this obvious equality category because it literally includes equal opportunity and treatment regardless of background, which is part of a couple of ideologies that I've discussed already. And just uh, quickly, the majority of faculty with equality conceptions, they tended to lecture at least 80% of the time with some Q&A sprinkled in. And that makes sense, right? Because if you understand equity to be provided equal treatment, access and opportunity, what better way than to lecture than to do this, right? Every student gets exactly the same treatment and the same opportunity to ask and answer questions. It's pretty straightforward. Now, I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of how these equality conceptions of equity um, informed practices and interactions with students. So here's one participant who shares that the student of color had to work. They were late turning in a project and they asked for an extension. And I was like, I can't do that because it's not fair to the rest of the students. So this is a common idea that came up given an extension, letting them take an exam late or being flexible in any way, it's not fair to the rest of the students. But I would argue that the, this idea is implying that the status quo is fair. Some students don't have to work and they have more time to study in Excel while others have to work to pay tuition, they have to take care of families. So this framing of equity as equal treatment and fairness ends up being inequitable for students who often need the most support. And of course, this also speaks to the social construction of academia as a spade for financially privileged folks. And how we as educators end up perpetuating this paradigm by using these narratives. And here we see how an equality conception focusing on equal opportunity played out. And this professor lamented that students usually don't take him up on opportunities such as going to office hours or attending out of class tutoring session. And he's become very frustrated. And now he tells his students on the first day of class, you're adults, I'm not going to treat you like you're juveniles. If you're being offered some options here, it's up to you whether you choose to take them or not. It's your choice. You might say, this is not important for me, therefore I choose not to do it. Then you own the consequences for this action as well. So this assumption of equal opportunity doesn't consider the different constraints that may be informing students' choices, right? For example, they may have to work or caregiving obligations, as I just mentioned, or 
um, they might have other reasons for not taking advantages of the resources, right? For example, it dismisses the fact that students from minoritized backgrounds often report exclusionary experiences by peers and TAs, and so they don't feel comfortable attending out of class study sessions. And therefore, this aligns with this um, abstract ideology as well, right, which focuses on individuals in a supposed equal opportunity environment, and therefore they're blamed for not performing well. And also, I wanted to highlight that this is, aligns really well with the research on instructor talk. I highly recommend that you take a look. Uh, my colleague, um, Dax Ovid at UGA, um, not only looked at negatively phrased instructor talk, but how students interpreted those talks. So I've co-authored work on neg negatively phrased instructor talk, which is non-content talk by instructors that can be discouraging for students. And um, Dr. Ovid then looked at how students perceive these, and they um, there's definitely congruence in that these are types of uh, comments that students do remember and do affect students' perception of the class. Okay, so the final one that I'll share for this um, study is students, uh, faculty with equality conceptions use colorblind framings to explain, explain the underrepresentation of students of color in STEM. And in this case, they use minimization of racism and individualizing performance. So within the sample, all faculty who defined equity as equality also held color view, uh, colorblind beliefs about the underrepresentation of students of color in STEM. So this was a, a exact match. If you have an equality belief, you also held a colorblind belief. And we can see how these liberal ideologies are inextricably in, intertwined, right? And so a quote here for this participant is, by the time they get to college, there's not much we can do. My stance is that it's not because they feel, let's say they're black or Hispanic. I don't belong because people would discriminate me, okay? I think a lot of it has to do with how well they perform because of past experience. So here we see both the minimization of racism and the deficit framing of students, right? And while it is true that some students of color may come less prepared to college due to resource inequality because of systemic racism in K-12 schools, these types of explanations wrote off students of color as incapable of learning or being able to catch up. And it worked to absolve faculty from responsibility in helping them. And so in summary, while equal treatment and opportunity um, are a great ideal to strive towards, it fails to account for existing inequities that keep students from different backgrounds from experiencing equitable access opportunities and outcomes. In other words, providing students with equal treatment and opportunity when many of them do not come to the classroom on a level playing field means that faculty are maintaining or even exacerbating inequities. And this also demisses the exclusionary lived experiences of minoritized students in STEM environments, leading them to think that they don't belong. As such, this reframed liberal ideology of equal opportunity and treatment works to promote inequitable outcomes while allowing educators to believe that they're being equitable to students. And now let's finally explore how these ideologies appeared to be enacted in learning environments. And in this study, we asked how do STEM college instructors notice and problematize anti-Black events in classroom cases? And so briefly, there are two narrative cases that were developed. There are short stories that richly depicts a moment in time. And they describe the experiences of two black students in a college of science classroom. And these cases specifically described anti-blacks racialized events, among other events, which were, perf uh, which were all kind of designed based on prior research and a, a group of students um, who identified as black or African-American uh, and were part of the university system in which we did this research. And so these um, anti-Black racialized events were representative of the types of, of experiences that Black students have in PWIs or primarily white universities. And faculty who participated um, in this survey, it was an open-ended survey with the cases, they would read the cases and they were asked to name up to five problematic things that they noticed in the classroom and explain why those were problematic. And we conducted qualitative content analysis of the responses. 
And the participants were 34 participants from various STEM backgrounds and social backgrounds. There was an anonymous survey, so we don't have identity um, measures. And they were all part of a large research intensive university in the Southeastern United States. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but I'm going to introduce you to um, four different um, events. And there are eight of them that were racialized events between the two cases. And briefly, the stereotype case was when a black student was stereotyped as an athlete by the professor. The second was uh, when a black student, uh, Spencer in this case, Samantha um, Sam was a stereotyped student. Spencer um, expressed an idea, which Alex, who is an Asian student, echoes, but that results in praise from the instructor only to Alex, therefore ignoring Spencer's contribution. And um, let me just skip to Gaslit. And Gaslit uh, was when Spencer states that he's feeling racism in the class and the classmen, um, and the classmate insists that it's just because the topic is hard. It's nothing to do with racism. And so let's start with a positive first this time. And so here is an example of somebody who noticed race and racism and problematized it. So the participant says, Dr. Weiss' comment to Sam about being an athlete, the stereotyped event, is thinly veiled racism. This is most problematic because it involves direct communication from Dr. White to Sam. It's a personal judgment of Sam. It's influencing Dr. Weiss' perception of Sam. And it was overheard by the rest of the group and may influence their perception of Sam, or at least her comfort level in the group. So here we see an example of a participant who both noticed a racialized event and problematized it as racist and discuss all the ways in which this could affect Sam and Sam and the instructor's relationship and Sam and her peers' relationship. This is not a common response. Instead, what we saw was that over half of the respondents included only color evasive interpretations of the case. And here we have a participant noticing the event by sidestepping the discussion of race and worrying about appearances instead. The teacher did not acknowledge students' contributions. The teacher should have thanked both Spencer and Alex for making the same contribution. The teacher not acknowledging both students may make the teacher seem biased. So the language in this response suggests that the participant thinks that seeming bias is more problematic than the impact of the bias of ignoring the contribution of the Black student. So this concern centered on avoiding the appearance of racism rather than naming and addressing it is a hallmark of colorblind and evasive ideology, right? We don't want to acknowledge that racism exists. Everything is fine. It's not about race anymore. So we don't want to appear. The only bad racists are the overt racists. So we don't want to appear racist because most of us aren't really, right? And so um, the concern is about appearing racist rather than engaging in inadvertent racism. And this response um, paraphrased the case while explaining how the interaction impacted Spencer. And this professor says, Dr. Z neglected Spencer's comments and contributions, recognizing the mistakes in the discussion, but granted the credit to Alex, who just repeated Spencer's opinion. That obviously disengaged Spencer eventually. So this was a common way in which color evasive ideology and white culture manifests in STEM, right? By refusing to discuss inequality in terms of groups and instead focusing on individuals. So they effectively erased racism because it focused on the individual without the respective races, right? So Alex is not an Asian student who is usually stereotype of being smart. Spencer is not the black student who's usually stereotype of being uh, um, of inferior under, uh, intellects, right? So we have all of that is erased. And now we just have that, you know, Spencer is disengaging, but it's not about racism. And so these responses allowed racial power dynamics that operates in the lives of Black students in STEM to go unchallenged. And participants evaded race in many ways. And feel please, I uh, read the paper um, so you can see the various ways in which it's happening. Uh, but for the last quote here, I wanted to highlight a rare but an important example in our data set. 
And this participant says, I did not notice any significant problems. The author, us, the case creators, try to point out color and race to steer the reader, but the situation sounds like a typical day. And then in the same response, uh, where we asked for a suggestion for improvement for this professor in this case, the response is remove the white, black, and Asian from the story. So this response noticed race and determined that it was irrelevant, even though Spencer names racism as something he's feeling in the gaslit example I mentioned. And so this is a harmful response because an instructor who is unwilling to consider racism when it's explicitly named as the problem by a student is really working hard to evade race. And therefore, it'll be unlikely to recognize their own racism, their uh, racist behaviors, the behaviors of others in their classrooms and beyond. And so in summary, this study was the first to help us see how colorblind and evasion ideology can then be enacted in response to racialized um, anti-Black events in the classroom. And it helps us see how harmful color evasiveness, ev evasiveness can be as it's both an obstacle to recognizing inequities with the, within a STEM classroom, and it removes responsibility for instructors to work to address racial inequities in learning environments. And therefore, inequities can be exacerbated by these participants. And finally, um, I just wanna, we're almost done. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to quickly comment on these study samples, okay? They were convenience samples. They were not representative of the general faculty population. In fact, they were selected twice over. In the case of the study that I just discussed, they were self-selected into participating in a professional learning community that met on a regular basis to learn about inclusive teaching. And then they also opted in to take the anonymous surveys at least once, if not twice. And then the studies on the equity conceptions and sense making of racial in inequality, not only did the participants volunteer to interview to talk about how they define equity and discuss their teaching, which was in the invitation I sent out, they volunteered to do so in the summer of 2020 during the so-called racial reckoning due to the police murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the killings of other African-Americans by other people and by the pandemic, right? So, and not to mention they were moving labs, helping their grad students figure out, you know, staggered times in the labs and all of these other stressors, and they volunteered. This is all to make this point that if there is bias in these samples, they would skew towards a more progressive group of people, right, that have ideals that are progressive. And yet we see a high number of these participants espousing problematic beliefs that can lead to exclusionary practices. Which brings me back to that idea and strengthens the argument that liberal ideologies such as colorblindness, equal opportunity and treatment, individualism and meritocracy, which are also core values in STEM, can work as barriers to understanding inequities and injustices and to exonerate oneself from taking the responsibility to address these issues. And so I just wanted to say that what I'm saying is not new. Liberal ideologies are thoroughly critiqued by sociologists of gender and race, feminist scholars, critical race theories. In fact, um, critical race theories, one of the tenet tenets is critiquing liberal ideologies. And scholars across disciplines from education to law and many others have discussed the problematic nature of these ideologies. All I'm doing here is trying to put it all together um, to contribute more evidence of the power of these ideologies in the context of faculty beliefs in college STEM education. And so what are the implications of this? Well, if we are asking um, for implications for individual STEM faculty, they have the power to advocate for equity and justice. And this is especially true for tenure line professors because they're future department chairs, administrators, and policymakers. Not to mention the obvious, right? They teach a many great number of students um, every year. And so, while faculty members may be constrained by some systemic issues, and I'm not going to deny that they don't, plenty of us do, right? Um, we may have some ideas of what we want to do and might not be able to enact them, right? But we still have some power to do some things. And we can use our power to challenge problematic narratives and discourses and become change agents, or we can use our power to be gatekeepers and continue to perpetuate 
injustices via our inaction or inadvertently because of these ideologies, right? So STEM faculty need to work towards developing a critical consciousness. They need to learn about the systemic nature of inequities and what they can do to disrupt them in their spheres of influence. And then STEM departments and institutions, <laughs> they need to provide opportunities for future and current faculty to develop this critical consciousness and um, training in equitable teaching practices. And institutions also need to provide the right environment for this to happen. They, faculty are pressed for time, right? And, and so an incentive and reward system needs to be in place that values that work. And so it's not just about checking a box or getting a side award. It's about how is equity and justice threaded throughout the uh, evaluation systems that we make so that faculty um, feel supported and they feel um, and they feel that they must include these things in their teaching and their mentoring and their research so that it's just part of what they do. And then th and that way we might be able to change the paradigm a little bit about what counts and um, then motivate some more faculty to engage in that work. And then of course we have to re-envision the culture of STEM. Um, there's no way around this, right? We need to problematize these liberal ideologies, this idea that STEM is objective, neutral, and meritocratic and equal opportunity and colorblind and gender blind, right? We have to acknowledge the culture of whiteness and how it works to dismiss other way of being and knowing as legitimate, right? Which ultimately, uh, ultimately dehumanizes STEM and um, to those who are not seen as uh those centered um, ways of, um, sorry, so those who are, not, who are not seen as belonging to the white culture. Anyway, so um, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. I'm grateful for my study participants uh, who are so generous with their time and candor, and thank you for being here. I'm ready for questions. <laughs>